Bow your heads with me, if you will. Father, we thank you for this time and privilege and opportunity just to share with the students and faculty at Wesley, our place we call home. We thank you for the opportunity to be here. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to guide us as we share these few minutes together. We give you glory in Jesus' name and every heart said amen. amen. Let me first thank you for the privilege and opportunity to be here. I actually stand here with a little ambiguous feelings. I uh, a little, little nervous because I'm standing before my professors and, and as an alumni, and then also I guess they're probably a little nervous too. They're wondering, did we teach him anything? <laughs> <laughs> so we stand here, and I, I want to just for, for this moment uh, to all of the students that are here, the online students, we want to uh, thank you for being here, if that's a correct word, and to our special guests here, uh, thank you. We do believe that this is the, 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 the best university in Mississippi, uh, amen, seminary in Mississippi. And I want to give a, a special, uh, if we, we say in the country sometimes, since I'm still raising, well, one teenager, the rest of them are no longer teenagers, a, a shout out to a few folks, if I may, I guess you young folks use that word sometimes, uh, to, to several uh, gentlemen that are in the audience here, one being Dr. Cockrell, uh, and another one being Dr. Matt Friedman, and Another being Dr. Easley, and another being Dr. Yuri, uh, whom we had the privilege of, of, of them pouring into our lives. And I thank God for uh, Wesley Biblical Seminary because I was, uh, was bivocational uh, until a little while ago. Uh, and I was a respiratory therapist by profession. And I was looking through uh, the book one night because I felt that call of God upon my life. And I, I was looking through, I don't even remember what the magazine was. I don't remember what time of night it was. And I saw something about Wesley Biblical Seminary on there. And so I picked up the phone and I called up to Wesley and I, I talked to this gentleman here and I came up here and, and, and had a, a talk with him. And I knew that Wesley was the place for me. And uh, after that, I came here and I uh, as Becky said, uh, if you allow me to use that affectionate term, and uh, Dr. Lumen, for the sake of, of terminology and, and fellowship and friendship, and we were in class together, and her husband called, and, and we, st we were at the old place over there, and uh, at, over on, off Beasley by Tugaloo, and we, we had a good time. It was a joyous time, and, and these men poured into our lives, and, and I stayed here and, and with, with uh, w with the faculty and staff, and they poured into our lives, and, and they were giving to us, and they were putting things in our lives. Not only were they putting parsing verbs and, and, and all those things, and church history and, and practical theology and all those things, they were pouring into our lives. And, 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 and Susan, Dr. Spann told us that, that success is being what God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. And, and that, that was our, our standard, our cup-bearing word. And so they, they poured into us because I, I believe then as now that having come back some, that, that what they're putting in, in, in your lives is, is not all the verbs and not all the history, but something that, that you know that is translated that takes place after the church history and after the verbs and after the Hebrew because it all comes, it, it's applying what God has put in your life to your actual setting. Because we're all in probably different settings. We'll go back after you leave the class. You go to your individual ministries or your group ministries. And God pouring something in your lives. And, and I want to thank uh, the four of you that I called and my classmate. Thank you all for the privilege of passing this way. Uh, thank you all for investing in me. Because I even one point between school and work and all those things, I got ready to quit. <laughs> And I was ready to, I was sitting in my little Toyota, and uh, that little, I got a Toyota, not the same one, but I still have a Toyota. And, and I was getting ready, I said, Lord, I'm, I'm tired, and, and I talked to, one was this gentleman right here, Dr. Cockrell, and I said, Dr. Cockrell, I'm ready to go, I'm just, just tired. And I, I mean, if you get tired sometimes, you just, they, sometimes you're juggling all this stuff and trying to do this and trying to do that, and I talked to Dr. Cockrell, and, and, and he told me, no, no, Kevin, don't, don't, don't. And Dr. Furman uh, also. And, and so uh, uh, I, I stayed. And I thank God for that. And, and wasn't it had nothing to do with the school, just tired of juggling stuff. Um, and I thank God for that. Thank God for you. Thank God for the investment. Uh, thank God for Wesley Biblical Seminary. 
thank God for the privilege of having passed this way. And I, I, I know that there are great things in store for all of you as your instructors pour something. Because that's kind of where I want to go uh, today because I do, just sharing my testimony, I guess I was asked to preach. <laughs> so, but that, that, that's part of my story. And I thank God again for Wesley. Thank God for passing this way because the, these, these men and ladies that they were pouring into our lives, and I believe that's the pattern that, that Jesus did. He, he said in, in Matthew 4, 19, he said, he told the disciples, he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And the, the book that we, the four books that we call the gospel are the next three and a half years of Jesus pouring into these men. He's pouring his life into them to make them, show them how to become fishers of men. And so if you would turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, uh, verses 36, 37, and 38. And Jesus is, is still pouring into the lives of these men. And pouring by pouring. And Jesus has a, a unique way of doing things. And he's always, Jesus is, is either you like him or you don't. There's normally not a middle ground with him. Either you like him because in chapter 8, the Lord is, is talking uh, to some people and and one, one man comes up and says, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. And, and Jesus said, foxes have holes, and the birds have their have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then one man comes and says, Lord, uh, uh, let me go bury my, the dead. And he said, let the dead bury the dead. And then there, there are two men that have a demon in them, in them and they, uh, Jesus cast the demon out, and they go into swine, and the swine drown themselves, and all of a sudden the whole town comes out, and tell the Lord, well, we don't want you here. So he, he has a way of turning people off. But at the same time, he draws people. Uh, because in chapter 9, when we pick up the story, that in, 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 in chapter 9, the Lord is, is he's sitting down with, 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 with sinners and publicans. And the Pharisees said, Lord, uh, say, actually his disciples said, why are you, why is your master sitting with these folks? And Jesus said that to them as he overhears the conversation, he says that, look, I, I came not to call the sinners, I mean the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's, he, he's with people that the Pharisees don't want to be with. He, he's drawing this crowd. And when this certain ruler, his, his servant, is, is dead, and he said, Matthew, if you just lay hands on him. And Jesus goes into the room and he puts some people out. How many times, you know, sometimes you can't pray with everybody. Because they may not be on the same page you're on. Hello, somebody. They, they, they may be on a different page. And, and, but he, he puts these people out, and he grabs a little girl by the hand, and she gets up. Now everybody's ready to have church now. He's raised the dead, and they're ready to go. He's ready now. But he has a way either shoving people, uh, turning people off or drawing people. But now when we get to verse 36, and when Jesus, uh, he looks at the multitude, and the scripture says he has compassion on them. And he see, and because the people are fainting because they are like sheep that have no shepherd. And Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And he challenged them, pray ye to the Lord of harvest that he would send laborers into the harvest. And that's why I want to grab right there. What is our greatest need? Our greatest need. And Jesus is suggesting, and let me propose to you, that our greatest need is not to do away with, with abortion. Our greatest need is not to ban same-sex marriages. I believe our greatest need is that God will send laborers into his harvest. Yes, we need to ban abortion. Yes, we need to do away with gay marriage. But our greatest need is that we will have people that will labor in the harvest. If you can get people to work, you can get anything done. If you can find a few people, whether in whatever the ministry is, if you can find some people that don't mind getting their hands dirty, if they don't mind staying late a little while, if they don't mind putting their hands to the plow, you can get the work done if you have laborers. I don't mean laborers like that's in Luke chapter 10 when there was a man come down from Jericho and he falls among thieves and then the priest come by and he passed by. On the other side. And then a Levite comes up and he passed by on the other side. We don't need laborers like that that keep passing by. We need some folks that's going to stop. Amen. We don't need people like, how many of you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? <laughs> when they, that song, they come listen to a story about a man named Jed. The poor mountaineer barely kept his family fed. 
And then one day he was shooting at some food, and up from the ground comes a bubbling crude. All that is, black gold, Texas tea. Sounds good. Well, the first thing you know, Jet's a millionaire. The Ken folks said, Jet, move away from there. Said, California is the place you all will be, so he loaded up the truck. And they moved to Beverly. And they got, we don't need for everybody to move to Beverly. Somebody needs to stay. <laughs> everybody doesn't need to leave. We need laborers. We need laborers. Jesus looked around and he said when he saw the multitude and he had compassion on them. And that Greek word is nizomai, which means that, that there was something visceral going on on the inside of him. And Reuben uh, Jordan said in, in, in his book, uh, of the makers died, he said that the stomach, aside from the brain and spinal cord, the stomach has more nerve endings than any other part of the body. So when you feel something and you hear the expression, you have a gut feeling, you're probably right. <laughs> that when it hits your gut, because there are more nerves, endings, and things there than any other part of the body. So he used that word that, that he had compassion on them because when he saw their, con uh, their condition, and he was moved. He had compassion on them. But not only he was moved because of what he saw. And my question to you, are you moved by what you see? When you see our culture that is slowly, morally, spiritually deteriorating, are you moved? When you see things like abortion and same-sex marriage and, and a proliferation of sin on the airways, are you moved? moved. When you see our children dropping out of school, when you see our children standing on corners, are you moved? When you see people wasting time, standing around, wasting time, Miles Monroe said he went to a fellow, they went to a fellow one time and said, man, what's going on? He said, I'm killing time. He said, uh-uh, brother, time killing you. <laughs> are you moved? Are you moved? But the Bible says that when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion. And the scripture said because they, they, they fainted. They couldn't make the journey. They didn't have enough spiritual energy. They didn't have enough physical energy. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have the spiritual nor physical stamina to make the journey. And ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, People are standing up today, but they fainted. They are not making the journey. They are falling because, and fainting because they don't have that spiritual, physical, emotional energy to finish the journey. And the Bible says that Jesus had compassion on them because they were like sheep that had no shepherd. And the next verse said something. It said, he said, pray ye. That, that, that brother, the harvest is plentiful. The harvest, that, 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 that harvest, that, that rismos, that, that, that word, that, that, that group, those potential disciples, that, that group that were to come into the kingdom of God. All of those people said, the harvest is plentiful. But. The laborers are few. And he uses a farming word, laborers, because farmers are particular and they know that they are dependent on the weather. They are dependent on the rain. They are dependent on because the, 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 the cold season may last too long and the warm season might come in too soon. And therefore, it'll mess up the crop either way. That farmers know that they are dependent on God. You and I in our ministries, we are dependent on God. There are too many things out there to handle on our own. We cannot handle all of these issues on our own. I don't care whether you're ministering to two people, 200 or 2,000. If you got two people, you got two problems. <laughs> if you got 200, it's 200 problems. But that's the nature of the work. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers, a few, the laborers, those that, 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 that will go and do the work. We, 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 we need laborers, church. Laborers that will labor not only with themselves, but will labor with God. 
until they get an answer to what they seek, until they get a solution to the ministry that God has assigned them to. He said, he said, look, the laborers are few because we all often, so often want a quick work. But farmers know that crops don't grow overnight. That it takes time. They have to be nurtured. They have to be tended to. They, they have to be followed after and, and followed up with. That they need to depend on God and time to work with to develop the crop. But he said the laborers are few. In our society, we are so accustomed to McDonald's and Burger King. And hold the pickles and hold the lettuce special order. Don't upset us. We got to have it now. Real quick. Real quick. But ministry takes time. Farming takes time. We don't need temporary teasers and, and seldom seen saints. We need some seasoned saints. We need dedicated de deacons and seasoned stewards and all of these. We need people that are willing to take time and do ministry. You can't learn Greek and Hebrew overnight. You can't learn the state of the Reformation and church history overnight. You can't learn how, how to do ministry overnight. It takes time. It takes laboring. And Jesus is saying here, he said, wait a minute. We need some laborers that are going to see about the harvest. Because God wants to bring people in. God wants to work with people. God wants to work inside of people and it takes time and I'm trying to find someone that will labor labor how many of you look back two years ago three years ago to where you were in your spiritual walk with God and think about where you are now hopefully you do better <laughs> but it, you didn't get there overnight it took time and somebody labored with you somebody prayed for you you are here today. You are in this chapel right now because someone labored for you, someone labored with you, someone labored over you. And you are a witness right now because someone was laboring. And that's what God wants because the scripture said, pray ye to the Lord of harvest that he sent forth laborers, someone that's willing to work, someone that don't mind staying long. We, went, we were, came home one day from... From I can't remember where I was coming from, but came home one day that was smelled gas all over the place. And I, this is on the outside. The, the, the atmosphere was just filled with gas. And we called the gas place. It was about 5 o'clock. And right on, I guess it was time for everybody to go home. And the lady said, uh, uh, couldn't you have called before 5? <laughs> and I'm sitting here thinking that my house is in danger, the neighborhood is in danger. And she's worried about a few minutes on the clock. <laughs> she didn't feel like laboring. Do you have time for people when they're hurting, they're in need? Do you have time to spend some time with them? Do you have time to labor with them? Do you have time because the Lord wants laborers? Let me close, let me close. Because the Lord came down, spent three and a half years laboring with those disciples, pouring into them, putting in them to mold them. And then the story goes that when he went back to heaven and he, he was explaining to the angels all some of the things that happened while he was on earth. And the angel said to the Lord, he said, you mean you left all of that responsibility in the hands of those feeble men? And the angel said, what if they fail? And Jesus looked at him and said, they won't fail. The Lord believes in you. The Lord's counting on you. And you won't fail. And then I go to my seat. Robert Louis Stevenson says that there was a storm at sea. And the, the people were below deck and they were afraid and they were worried because there was water coming into the ship. And, and, and the captain was, was on the deck, only one on deck that's resting at the helm and trying to steer the ship. And, and one of the uh, wearied and tired and afraid Passengers on the boat stuck his head up out of the trap door and looked up. And when the captain saw him, he smiled at him. And the man went below deck and he said, he told the rest of the people, he said, I have seen the face of the captain. 
And he said, all is well. And you and your ministry, you and your class and your school, whatever God has assigned you to, you've seen the face of the Lord. All is well. Amen. Labor, labor. But the Bible said, let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. David said, I once was young, but now I'm old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Isaiah, Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings of eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. Now there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. With the Lord, the righteous judge shall give me at that day. Labor, brothers and sisters, labor. And the Lord will say, well done. Amen. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing together. We thank you for the opportunity of lifting up your name. Thank you for the privilege of being here. We give you glory. We give you praise. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray. Amen, amen. amen.